In the previous video, we examined money's function as a medium of exchange. We observed that the economic advance that allowed mankind to move beyond a basic struggle for survival and to begin building capital and civilization was the division of labor, whereby individuals specialize on specific productive activities and then exchange the products of their labor for all of the other goods and services they need to live. This is the source of 99% of the wealth that exists on Earth. We further observe that the division of labor requires the existence of a medium of exchange in order to expand beyond the very narrow scope of exchange which can be accomplished via barter. In our time, solitary self-sufficient production is no longer an option. When the population of the earth was small and land and natural resources were readily available, it was still possible to opt out of the, of the exchange economy. Today, this is no longer possible. There is no unclaimed land or natural resources available anymore. In order to survive, one must participate in the prevailing economic system. There's no other alternative. And since the division of labor requires the existence of a medium of exchange, it's no exaggeration to state that our very survival depends on the existence of money. But facilitating the exchange of goods and services is not the only function of money. Depending on who you ask, you'll be given a list of two or more additional functions that money serves. The two other primary purposes that our current form of money serves are a unit of account and a store of value. Some would add other functions to this list, such as a standard of deferred payment, a unit of credit, or a vehicle for speculation. However, I would argue that all of those functions are inherent in the three functions already mentioned, and that a full understanding of money can be achieved by considering only these three primary functions. So, let's consider money's function as a unit of account first, because it's simple and straightforward. In a barter economy, quote-unquote value is established anew each time an economic exchange takes place. If I trade you a dozen eggs for a gallon of milk, that means that we've agreed that one egg is equal in value to one twelfth of a gallon of milk. But now let's say that the next day I trade another dozen eggs for six ears of corn. That transaction contains the implicit agreement that an ear of corn is worth two eggs. But can we necessarily conclude that the producers of corn and milk will agree to exchange six ears of corn for a gallon of milk? Not necessarily. The market is often referred to as a price discovery mechanism. And this is an important concept because a key characteristic of the market system, as opposed to a centrally planned economy, for example, is that no one's in charge of assigning prices to various goods and services. Rather, those prices are discovered through the bargaining process between free individuals. A product is worth whatever price it can command in the market, no more and no less. And no one has the power or authority to impose their will on the determination of price. And to return to the case of a barter economy, price discovery is problematic. It's not possible to definitively determine the relative prices of hundreds or thousands of different goods and services relative to each other because there's no universal measure whereby we can compare their values. And if someone plans to earn a livelihood by dedicating themselves exclusively to producing eggs, he or she needs to, not, to know not just how much milk can be obtained in exchange for eggs, but also how much corn, how much chicken, how much clothing, how much wood, etc. can be obtained in exchange for eggs. The abstract concept of value can only be estimated by building a huge matrix of exchange values in terms of all of the various goods and services for which one might wish to exchange eggs. And in a non-monetary economy, that's not easy or simple to do. A commonly accepted unit of account addresses this need. It essentially provides a standard measure that can be used to compare the relative values of all of the goods and services which make up the economy. Now let's move on to money's third function as a store of value. This is where things start to get complicated. So what is a store of value? Well, imagine that your area of specialization in an economic system built on the division of labor is to raise cows for meat. 
The first thing to take note of is that your situation would be quite different from someone who raises chickens and sells eggs. Eggs are produced on a daily basis in relatively small quantities, whereas the process of raising, slaughtering, and butchering a cow involves a significant amount of time between the beginning of the process and when the finished product is available for sale. An egg producer has product to sell on a daily basis, but for someone who raises cows, the situation is different. That person will experience long periods during which he has nothing to sell, and then there will be short periods where he has large quantities of product which must be sold quickly. This mismatch between the time frame of production and consumption creates the need for a store of value. The beef producer needs to periodically sell large quantities of beef all at once, and then needs to hold the proceeds in a form that allows him to obtain the necessities of life until the next time he slaughters a cow. Obviously, stockpiling a perishable product like beef isn't a viable way to store value in such a way that it can be exchanged as needed for all of the other goods and services that the beef producer doesn't produce for himself. Regardless of the nature of the particular productive process that an individual specializes in, there will inevitably be times when their production and consumption don't coincide. We just looked at the challenges for a producer of beef in terms of obta obtaining the products he needs on a daily basis due to the sporadic time frame of his production process. Conversely, the egg producer whose production process has a very different time frame will have his own problems relating to the mismatch between production and consumption. For example, how could an egg producer ever save up enough product to exchange for an expensive item like a piece of machinery or a vehicle? By the time he had stockpiled enough eggs, many of them would have gone bad. So regardless of the specific area of specialization that an individual engages in, direct exchange without the use of money, i.e. barter, will cause significant problems. And this is where the need for a store of value comes in. The beef producer needs a way to store a relatively large amount of income all at once in a form that can be used on a daily basis to purchase the things he needs to live. The egg producer needs a way to store his daily income in a form which can be accumulated for large future purposes. Both needs are met via the use of a store of value. So, now that we've covered the three basic functions of money, Let's take a step back and make an observation about a fundamental law of nature. The vast majority of goods and services lose value with the passage of time. Meat rots, milk spoils, metal rusts, wood gets eaten by termites. Furthermore, the possession of goods entails the necessity to store and protect those goods against damage or theft. So real economic goods impose carrying costs on their owners. The longer the goods are held, the greater is the loss caused by holding them. And this applies to labor as well. A laborer who doesn't sell his services one day still needs to feed and clothe himself. Failure to do so will result in hunger and or sickness, which in turn will make him less capable of engaging in productive labor in the future. Labor can't be stored for future sale and failure to sell one's labor today makes one less capable of performing labor tomorrow. So there's a constant pressure on anyone who earns his living through selling labor. And this same pressure applies to anyone who, pro who produces perishable goods. When a producer of eggs and a producer of beef meet to negotiate an exchange, they're both subject to pressure to get rid of their products. Failure to do so will result in economic losses for both of them. This is an inexorable fact of nature. And the fact that it applies to everyone means that economic exchange takes place on a level playing field. Certainly, different products degrade at different rates, but almost all of them degrade, and therefore everyone is compelled by the nature of their goods to exchange them sooner rather than later. This pressure applies to both parties to every barter negotiation, because both of them will suffer loss if they fail to agree to terms for an exchange. Of course, there are a small number of goods which are exempt from the ravages of time. Gold, for example, doesn't rust or decay. It can be buried in the ground for hundreds of years without suffering any significant decay or degradation. 
Art is another category of product that doesn't necessarily decline and may in fact increase with the passage of time. Fine wines would be another example. Gold's imperviousness to decay has led to its use as a store of value throughout history. The problem, and this is the heart of Silvio Gassel's criticism of our existing forms of money, is that gold is not a good medium of exchange. And adopting gold as money means that it's used for all three functions of money. Using gold as money means that we expect it to function as a store of value, a unit of account, and a medium of exchange. I refer to this as the original sin of money. Combining our medium of exchange with a store of value in one instrument is the root cause of many of the problems which have plagued economic systems throughout history. From poverty to wealth inequality to economic stagnation and collapse, all of these big picture economic problems can be traced back to the fact that we have chosen to combine in one instrument our medium of exchange and a store of value. In our next video, we'll examine the interplay between money's functions as a medium of exchange and as a store of value more closely, and we'll explain why combining these two functions is irrational and harmful. This point is absolutely critical to understanding Silvio Gassel's analysis of money as it currently exists and his proposals for how we can create a better form of money in the future. Lastly, I want to mention that in about two weeks, after I've posted one or two more of these videos, I'm going to host a Zoom meeting for anyone who's interested in discussing these issues live. It'll be an opportunity for anyone who wants to ask questions, voice concerns, or propose alternative viewpoints. We'll record that meeting and post it as another video on this channel. And the plan is to hold these meetings monthly and for those videos to serve as a supplement to videos like this one. So if you're interested in participating, please leave your email in a comment below or contact me via private message or through the Silvio Gassell Institute Facebook page. Thanks for watching.